Hey, good morning. It's great to see all of you. Thanks so much for being patient with us with our internet problems. It's, uh, I don't think when Al Gore invented the internet that he realized that we we're going to be using it for so many things. But it's great to see you today. Hope you're doing well with this coronavirus, staying at home with your kids and your spouse. And, uh, let me encourage you to find some creative things to do. One of the things that me and my wife have been doing is we've been doing a lot of fishing. Now, it doesn't take a lot to do fishing. I don't think anybody's gonna give you a hard time about fishing licenses right now. So all you gotta do is go to Buy Low or uh, Publix, get yourself one pound of medium shrimp, go to Walmart, spend about $19 on a fishing rod. You can get, a, it'll come with a reel and everything. Then go to a location like the Limehouse Bridge where they uh, boat landing or to the Duncan's boat landing or over on the Wapoo side, you can go find any boat landing will give you really good access to the water. Let me encourage you, just uh, bring one of your family members with you, go out there and sit and, and uh, throw out some shrimp. Red fish will come up and bite, it'll be a great time. Another thing is go for a family drive. I know it feels like the 1950s, but we get in the car and we drive out to Walter Bar. We drive out to Old Sheldon Church down 17. We drove yesterday up into the Mount Pleasant and Ondaw area. We, these different places that we don't really normally go. Um, another thing that my pop used to do with us is take a couple of us to the airport. And we would just sit at the end of the runway and watch the airplanes go up and down and had a really good time with that. So um, we began to play games about identifying what kind of airplane was taking off. So that was another thing that we did as a family. And then me and Susan, we drove down to the Battery yesterday, and it was loaded with people, but it was loaded with people sitting in their cars, parked along the water, just eating a meal or having a little picnic inside their car. So l let me encourage you. This is, this is stretching every one of us to come up with some new and creative ways uh, how to do things. Um, I've fallen in love with grilled cheese again. Um, that's an interesting thing. Now, let me just tell you, grilled cheese with a little bit of uh, relish on it, you know, it's really good. Um, let me also, oh, uh, egg salad, that's another doozy. I know maybe you haven't had it in a long time, but it, it can be good. And then, I'll tell you what's over the top, ramen. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Unless you've had a really good bowl of ramen, mm, mm, mm. You won't miss eating out or dining out ever again if you get yourself um, one of those cartons of uh, ramen at your house. So we've been trying to come up with a lot of cool things. Well, today we're going to be going back into our Easter message and preparing for that, uh, talking about raised to raise. And we're using kind of two words that sound the same, but actually mean the opposite of each other. Uh, the idea that there were some things that God tore down so that he could raise up something new in our lives. So we're excited to continue that. And, and as we worship, you're gonna hear some of our songs are gonna be speaking blessings over your life. We're gonna be singing songs, not only of worship to God, but also praying that God's blessing will be upon you and your family. And, and at that time, just join in with us and, and let that uh, prayer of blessing just flow over your life. Because we have a Heavenly Father that loves us so much, that um, wants to take care of us in the midst of this adversity, and He's going to do it. Let's go.
so great to be with you guys today. Wherever you're watching this, I want you to say hi to their family around you. Take a time to enjoy this moment together. Welcome your hearts as Pastor Paul comes.
Yes, good morning to everybody. It's great to see you all today. Don't forget the dog. If the dog's there, welcome the dog in. It's, 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 it's okay. Well, it's great to see you on a beautiful Sunday morning, um, a Charleston morning. It's absolutely phenomenal. If you had to delay and wait for us to get here at 11 o'clock, thank you so much for your patience and, and being part of uh, helping us make that all work out. Um, let me just give you some updates on the church. Um, last Wednesday, we started our series online. Me and Susan started our Bible study called Resolute Heart. A lot of you joined us. Then we had communion right afterwards, and that's how we're doing communion here at Crosstown now is on our Wednesday night service. So we invite you to join us this coming Wednesday as we continue. We're learning about the Our Father, and, and for a lot of us that were raised in a traditional background, the Our Father became a prayer that was just something we said, and we didn't really understand it. So let me invite you to come because it's a prayer that you can unpack in times like this that really speak to every issue that's on your mind. Um, also, uh, this Sunday night, tonight at 7 o'clock, youth will be meeting via online. And uh, so let me encourage you. They had a great time last week. Let me encourage you to join in with that. Also, Thursday night, our children's church kicked off and will continue to do every Thursday night at 7 o'clock. So be a part of that with us as well. Um, we started what we call Med Love 20. And, and what that is is a lot of us were just... You know, I'm not a medical professional. I want to be able to help some way. So we started MedLove 20 here at Crosstown, and it's being led by Suzanne, who's our outreach pastor here at Crosstown. And we are uh, sending gifts to the ER crew of Roper St. Francis. Uh, as they're there, there's three different shifts that happen. We're sending these little uh, just kind of uh, candy gifts so that they can just have a little pick-me-up in the middle of what they're doing. So let me encourage you, continue to contribute to that. You can go online and find out how to do it. Download our app. That's a very big thing at this time is to have our app. So just go to the app store on whatever platform you operate out of and download that. Uh, also, we have an opportunity for you to give money to that so that when we have enough money, we send our uh, lawn cutting team out to cut the lawn of a medical professional that maybe a nurse or somebody that's not able to take care of their own property while they're taking care of the lives of others. Crosstown wants to be a part of that, and uh, we actually will pay for that to be done. So um, become a part of that. It's a way that you can still feel that sense of value in the middle of this uh, tough times. Can I just throw in one more thing? As me and Susan have just been working through this together, being locked at the house together, and I know after 33 years of marriage, we should just love being locked together. <laughs> I mean, it, no, it really is good. Um, but let me just encourage you, especially if you're a married couple. Um, one thing that we're learning is give each other space. That's a big thing. Um, but also continue to get ready in the morning. The temptation is to stop, you know, is to get up and start your day since you may be working from home. And, and you decide that, well, I don't think I'm going to shower today. Or um, I think, I don't know, I may not put my makeup on today, or I might not get dressed up, or I may stay in the same clothing, the same sweatpants. Let me encourage you to, um, every single morning as you go to work, you do that little bit of extra effort to present yourself to the world around you. Um, remember that the world that you're locked up with is your most important world, and they should be getting the best of you. So let me... Let me ask you this, still do your hair, and I'm talking to guys too. I mean, I, I, this doesn't happen by accident, okay? This, is, this just takes work. So let me encourage you. That's why I dressed up today. I'm like, you know, just bring that feeling of like life is still valuable, there is dignity, and I don't think I need to go anymore. I think all of us are, are know what that's about. So we've been talking about raise to raise and how Jesus, R-A-Z-E, tore down so that he could, R-A-I-S-E, raise up something new in our lives. And there always seems to be this interchange that goes on when God wants to do something new. Something's got to be taken down and something's got to be raised up. Something's got to be flip, flipped over so that it can be restacked. Something's got to be split open so that it can be uh, restored into something new. So we've been talking about how God has been doing this. We learned the first week how through the tearing of the veil in the temple that 
Jesus, through the broken body and his resurrection, created a new way for us to receive help in a time of need. That we have access to the Father through the raising, R-A-Z-E, and the R-A-I-S-E of the body of Christ. That we now have access to God. Then we also learned that when he did that, he also tore down the things that separate us as individuals. It separates the, the religious performance that we, we thought we had to do in order to get the love and the care and, and the approval of God in our lives. And that we're no longer separated, that our diversity is no longer a veil that should be separating fellowship and relationship with each other, but that God has tore down all that separation. But today we're going to be taking a look at what else Jesus tore down. And one of the things I think is so important, and it's really important right now, is our expectations. Because a lot of us have grown up with expectations. And, and I think God wants to tear down some old ones and he wants to raise up some new ones. So the resurrection story is loaded with expectations. We're going to read through it and it's, and it's loaded with expectations. And you're going to find out just like the stone in front of the tomb, some of them needed to be rolled out of the way. Some of the old expectations needed to be rolled out of the way so that a new expectation could be revealed into their lives. And we're going to find out that some of those expectations need to be developed in our lives and some of them need to be rolled out of the way. So let me pick up reading the story that comes to us out of Luke 24. And on the first day of the week, at early dawn, they went to the tomb and taking spices they had prepared. See, they, they got expectations. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And while they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, why do you seek the living among the dead? And this is kind of a challenge to expectations. He is not here, but he is risen. Remember, remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee. That the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified. And on the third day rise. And they remembered Jesus' words. And returning from the tomb, they told all these things to the 11 disciples and to all the rest that were there. And now it was Mary Magdalene and Jonah, uh, Joanna and Mary, the mother of James, and the other women with them who told these things to the apostles. But these words seemed to them... As an idle tale, and they did not believe them. But Peter rose and ran to the tomb, stooping and looking in. He saw the linen cloths by themselves, and he went home marveling at what had happened. So this story is loaded with expectations, good and bad, um, old and new. There's a lot of, a lot of stuff in this story. Um, the, uh, they were heading to the tomb to anoint the bo dead body of Jesus. That was their expectation. They expected to tend to the bandages and to place oil and anoint the body. They expected someone to be there to move the tomb out of the way, probably the soldiers that would be there. They expected to be mourning for about four to five days and, you know, uh, and, you know just weeping over the life of Christ as tradition would have. And then they were expecting nothing else would have changed. That the life was going to continue to go on exactly as it was. But there were some things in this story they weren't expecting to happen. They weren't expecting the stone to be already moved. That was kind of a new thing for them. They weren't expecting the body to be missing. They, they weren't expecting, and please excuse me if I'm laughing, is because I, I, um, I love the way that it says that they were um, uh, dressed in dazzling clothes. I mean, because when I was raising the girl, there was a girl, they, there was this thing called bedazzle. And so it just kind of threw me back to a bedazzling, fabulous. So these guys were, these guys were dressed fabulous. Um, uh, they weren't expecting that. Uh, okay. They didn't expect Jesus to be risen, even though he had tried to plant the expectation. See, that's a really important thing. They, his... His telling them about it didn't develop an expectation in their lives. So they were, they were kind of surprised. But I love the description of the level of expectation of the 11 disciples. I think it's absolutely incredible. Um, uh, 
And here's what, what their expectations were. These words seem to them an idle tale. The words of Jesus right, raising from the dead and the testimony of the ladies coming back and saying he raised from the dead, their expectation level is defined as an idle tale. Now, life has a way of shaping our expectations um, and challenging our expectations, whatever we have. And, and it doesn't take the coronavirus to do it, though it's doing it, it's exploiting it real well. Um, but the challenges of life have a way of turning the greatest story ever told into an idle tale. I mean, just imagine. Here's the greatest thing that we could have ever received as information is that Jesus died on the cross and then rose on the third day and has power over death. And to them, the greatest story because of life, because of difficulty, becomes just an idle tale. Now, just thinking about this phrase, idle tale, just kind of grabbed a hold of me. Sometimes there'll be a phrase that will, God will speak to me in, and it will like, um, and I want to understand it more. It's like, why did they call it an idle tale? Uh, so I, it kind of led me in a different direction. So I looked up an idle tale, and, and an idle tale is a story without force, or without movement. Um, it's what I would define as an object at rest. And as you can probably see, that it took my high school mind back to Newtonian physics, to the uh, three principles of motion uh, that Isaac Newton came out with, this idea of an, an object and, and what moves an object. And so it made me think about the law of inertia. And so it, it kind of all trickled into this, this idea of a, of a story that has no motion, an object at rest. And one of his principles says this, that an object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion remains in motion until acted upon by an unbalanced force. Basically, if any object is at rest, it will stay at rest until acted upon. It will just stay there. It will kind of sit in its mass, and it will just remain at rest until something acts upon that object. If an object's in motion, it will continue to move in a straight line um, until acted upon. Now, I know some of you science folks are out there, you mean, Paul, it'll move in a straight line as long as it's in a vacuum and not uh, experiencing the effects of gravity. Exactly, because they would be unbalanced outside forces. So, so an object remains at rest until acted upon. An object in motion remains going in that direction until acted upon. And I heard one scientist say it this way, stuff continues to do what stuff was doing. It seems to be like an, like an intrinsic value, that stuff continues to do what stuff was already doing. Um, and so it, that really just kind of dropped into my brain because I think we develop psychological inertia. Now, you have never heard that phrase before, and, it, and it's upon me for the next 20 minutes to make that phrase make sense. But if you really will just kind of think about it, we, we all are kind of like this object, um, or let's say our expectations are like this object. Uh, it's either at rest or it's in motion, and, and, and it needs or it is having some sort of force acting upon it. Um, we remain at idle or at rest in, in one expectation, or we're moved by another expectation that comes to us from the outside. So if you're stuck in a particular perception of life, about your life, or about God, or about whatever's going on, if you're, if you're at rest, let's say with bitterness, well, you will continue to remain at rest with bitterness until some outside force moves upon your life, something that's unbalanced, meaning that it's, it's kind of greater than you. It's, and there's a whole scientific explanation of unbalance, but I just can't go into that today. If you are at rest in anger, well, then you will remain at rest in anger. If you're going in a direction that has been, let's say, if you're moving in fear, well, then you will continue to move in fear until another outside influence, force, begins to act upon your life. 
and moves you in a different direction. So your expectation is kind of, uh, we're using it as a kind of a metaphor here. Your expectation is your inertia. That's, that's your expectation. Um, it is the level of resistance in your life to things moving you, getting you going, or changing your direction. It's kind of like the mass of your life. It's kind of like your belief, your worldview. It is, it is your resistance to get going, or it is your resistance to changing the direction that you're going. And your psychological inertia is at work today in your life. So, so this is the biggest question I'll probably ask you today. What puts you in motion? What, what motivates you? What, what gets your mass going? What, what puts you in motion? Or let me just ask it another way. What put you in motion? And um, what forces are acting upon your life? Uh, what outside forces um, affect the direction of your life the most? Is it CNN? Is it Fox News? Is it the medical reports? Um, is it the financial reports? Is it the jobless rates? I mean, what are the things, what are the forces that are, that are moving? What puts you in motion? Is it fear? Is it anxiety? Um, is it the people around you? Are you a person, and taking it out of the, the context of the virus, are you, are you the kind of person that only moves when somebody does something bad to you? And all of a sudden, you're put in to this motion of anger and resentment and reaction to this individual. So the big question is, is what puts you in motion? Or what put you in the direction that you're heading right now? Is it an event from the past? Is the mass of your life continuing to move in a direction because, let's say, what your father said to you when you were 10? Or because of a victimization that occurred to you when you were a young adult? Um, or something that you went through or, uh, later on in your life? But just know this, that whatever moves you will determine your expectation of life in this particular moment. So... For most of the disciples, when they heard the story of the, of the women about the resurrection, it did not put them in motion. And I don't know why it didn't put them in motion. Maybe because they were women. I mean, which would have been a cultural thing at that point. Um, maybe it was because they, uh, you know, didn't believe the story. But, well, it says that they didn't believe the story. But, I mean, for some reason... Hearing about the resurrection of Jesus just didn't change their disposition. They remained at rest because stuff wants to do what stuff was already doing unless some greater force moves upon it. So they just remained there, and they considered it an idle tale. Idle. Isn't that beautiful? It means now it has no force. It has no motion. It is just going to sit there. The resurrection of Jesus doesn't, doesn't affect my life at all. But I love it, and we don't give this guy enough credit. But Peter heard the story, and it says he jumped up. Why did he jump up? It's because there was something inside of him that allowed his expectations to be changed. A force moved upon him that he desired to have different expectations. Now, his expectation hasn't changed quite yet, but he's at that point that place of change where we all need to be today is that, okay, I've been hearing all these stories. I want something better to happen in my life, and I'd be willing to hear what it can be from a source that is greater than me. And so he runs to the empty tomb of Christ to see if it's true. See, a lot of us are, are no longer going into the scriptures no, or spending time with the Lord or or even seeking the wisdom in the direction of God. We're, we're not getting up from our misery or our speculation, and we're just sitting there. But the Apostle Peter, he's like, well, well, well maybe, maybe it can help. And, and here's something that you need to realize. is because all of us are bearing a story of expectation. And you got to ask yourself in your family, what story are you telling other people in your family right now? Are you always the person in the family that says, well... 30 more people died in South Carolina. Yep. Well, looks like uh, 
uh, New, state of New York's going to go again, go to war with the rest of the United States, or you know, you know, are you the one that's always bringing that kind, creating up that expectation, or are you somebody that is speaking words that stirs up a new expectation, something that could get somebody up from at rest and despair and begin to consider something else? So th I think it's absolutely powerful the role that they had in these stories. Because regardless of how much Jesus told them and showed him, it was not enough to change their expectations. See, that's what blows me. Because I, I, I mean, this blows me away. It's that it, the um, expectation, we think, well, if I saw a miracle, that would change my expectations. Yeah, would it? Well, if I, you know, if I heard that Jesus came and stood next to me, it would. Well, Jesus did that for three years. He did it right in front of him. He walked on water. He changed uh, water into wine. He you know, took some fish and, uh, and a loaf and turned it in and fed 5,000 people with it. But yet at the end of the day, they're still sitting there and their expectations is, are no higher than anybody else. Their expectations were this. Jesus was dead. Jesus was going to stay dead. And the three-year revolution of Christ was over. And, and no matter what Jesus did, that they remained at rest in that. So we're in a moment where we're expecting all kinds of stuff. And it's different for every one of us. Um, some of us are expecting to get sick. I mean, we're, we're just expecting it's going to happen to us. Um, some of us are expecting to die. You could be sitting home right now and, and you're just, well, I'm a goner. I'm over 60 and I'm going to die and I already have a pre-existing condition of a bad toenail, so therefore I'm a goner, you know, I'm going to be taken out. Uh, or we're expecting to lose a loved one. Maybe uh, some of us are expecting the apocalypse. You know, we expect the worst is going to happen, and we're out there stocking up on ammunition. Maybe some of us are expecting to lose our jobs, and, and maybe uh, all of us are expecting to lose some money. And I'm not saying that all these expectations um, are false, but are those the only expectations that we have? Are they the limit to the amount of motion that we got going at? Are we, are we at rest with that? Is, is that all that we're going to go with? Um, and all kinds of external forces move us in all kinds of directions. But when we look in the word of God and we begin to see the promises of God, um, and I think a lot of us have been looking at the word of God, why is it that some of those aren't moving us? Why, why is it that, we're, that when we go into the word, we just look at it like it's an idle tale? And can I, can I get really maybe personal here? It's just you could say, well, I'm Christian. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe in Jesus and all the works. But right now is when you find out whether or not the resurrection story of Jesus Christ is a, is a greater outside force, or it is an idle tale. You say, well, how would I know? Well, what's influencing you the most? Are you making all your decisions? Are all your daydreams, all your, well, while you're laying in bed at night, is, are, are all your expectations negative, or, or is the word of God beginning to be that outside force that's moving your life in the right direction? You know, I think it's kind of funny that Sir Isaac Newton and the Roman guards they actually have something in common in this story. I, I, you know, just looking at it, I'm not, Isaac Newton was a, a, a phenomenal Christian, but, but when it comes to this story, Isaac Newton's principle doesn't actually work. See, they realized that the body of Jesus had mass, but they didn't realize it had force. That hadn't been something that they had encountered before. You know, they didn't, the, the idea of this object was like, well, yes, this dead body of Jesus had mass to it, but it doesn't have any kind of force to it. They thought it would remain at rest, but we all discovered that the resurrection is not an idle tale, and that the body of Christ was not a body that was merely at rest, but yet it had power through the Holy Spirit. So when Jesus raised from the dead, he doesn't just raise for himself. When Jesus comes out of the tomb, he doesn't just come out of the tomb for himself. He wants to put things into motion. Just as his own body, which was at rest and was a dead mass, 
what he's showing to us in, in an allegorical kind of way is that, listen, as, my, as I was dead in my body and then I have come alive, well, you also can become alive in the deadness of your life and that you can have motion restored to your life no matter where it's at, where, whatever that you're in. So he comes alive to give motion. And what happens? The church is born. All of a sudden, at a, you know, this, this entity called the church of God, the church of Christ, is born. It's like it's all of a sudden made alive. And he, he puts those who trust his tale, this tale of his resurrection, who believe that it's not just an idle tale. What does he do? He begins to empower them, and he begins to enable them to tell this tale to others. Listen to how the Apostle Paul talks about physics. And you probably didn't realize it, but he is talking physics in Romans 8.10. He says, if Christ is in you, although the body is dead because of sin, it's a mass. It's a moral mass at rest. The spirit is life because of righteousness. If the spirit of him and greater ex external force uh, the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you. He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. It's like, oh my goodness, this is physics. This is incredible. He's like, you're in the deadness, you're in a dead marriage right now. And you hate her and she hates you and the kids hate both of you. And you're in the deadness of your marriage. And you're right, it's a mass of deadness. But if an external force begins to move into your life and into your marriage, it will quicken your mortal body. And I love that phrase. And, and it comes to us from the King James Version. Because I like it says where the Spirit of God will give life to your mass. It says, it can be translated the word quicken. And the reason why I like quicken is because that's a speed word. It's kind of like turbocharged, supercharged. All of a sudden, we have a body at rest, and then it's going to be quickened. We have an idle tale. We have idleness. And then we're told that the same, same spirit that quickened the dead mass of Jesus' body moves into us when we believe in Christ and begins to quicken the dead mortal mass of our lives. Man, that's exciting. That means that that there's a power that moves in my life that can change the, certain, the forces that are working against it. Relationally, financially, medically, physically, psychologically. The spirit of God quickens the idol, brings us to life. So now, because we have this outside force, we can resist the stories that are trying to move us towards fear. We have something that can begin to push back. And because we have this outside force within our lives that moves into our lives, our marriages can be moved from being at rest in ruins and can be moved in the direction of fulfillment. This is why the, uh, Jesus told the disciples, do not leave Jerusalem until you are filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. He's like, don't try to move your mass. You know, it, this isn't a story about, hey, try harder. Or you're really good and just do better next time. Jesus is like, no, you don't need to go anywhere until the physics of your spiritual life have been altered. The psychological inertia has been challenged by something outside of you and something greater than you, but that can move in and through your life. So he tells them, wait till the promise of the Holy Spirit. So through the Holy Spirit of God, we can have new life. We don't have to continue to move in the direction of resentment. We don't have to continue to move in the direction of the force of victimization. We don't have to be tossed to and fro, back and forth, by speculation in our lives. We don't have to be moved around in that kind of fashion. Newton and Romans, the Romans didn't factor on an object having force even at rest. And God wants you to know that through the spirit of God that we can develop, we can have within our lives the power of quickening, the power of pushback. John told us in 1 John 4, 
He says this, again, him, he also talking about Newtonian physics, but really more of how it affects us in our spiritual lives. Little children, you are from God and have overcome the world. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. We have within us an unbalanced force. There is nothing in the created universe that can balance and resist the power of God in our lives. And we are told that greater is he who is in us than all the different sources of messages of fear and doubt and, and, and concern and anxiety and loss about death, about sickness. So, so let me ask you the most important question of the day again. What puts you in motion? Or what puts you in the motion of your life right now? Let me ask you it this way. Is your faith just an idle tale? Or does it have within it the power of the, the outside force moved inside, quickening the mass of your life? Do you have the same power that rose Jesus from the dead, his forceless mass of his body, and caused it to rise on the third day? Do you have that power dwelling in you are you willing like Peter to get up and to see for yourself or are you just going to sit in an idle tale are you willing to search again and remember the words that he spoke to us that we are more than conquerors through Christ who strengthens us the the outside inside unbalanced force that helps us be more than conquerors when all of life, coronavirus, financial, relational stress is pushed on our lives. I don't care what the mass of your mistake is. It doesn't matter how much weight it is. It does, I, the mass of your, you'll say, well, my life is in, a, is in terrible ruins. It doesn't matter what the mass of your ruins are. It doesn't matter what the mess of your marriage is. And it and it doesn't matter what the message of the world is being spoken to you today. Jesus died and rose again so that our expectations could be this, that God wants the best for your life. I have come that you may have life, that you may be quickened, that you may be moving, and not just any life, but an abundant life that flows from heaven itself. So today we're going to end with a song about new wine and wine skins that God wants to put within us. And the Bible uses this idea of wine as a, as a metaphor and this sense of newness, something that um, bubbles up within us, something that, it, that we bring into us. And he, and he wants to break our old expectations, the old wineskins, right? the moving of the stone away from the tomb. And he wants to fill us with something brand new. So as we, we sing this song together, as we maybe stay in a moment of prayer, uh, let it be whatever you do at this moment, let it be equal to what Peter did. Let it be the same. It can be expressed differently. Let it be the getting up of your soul and to once again go and peer in to see if it's true. We all doubt at times. I doubt all the time. I probably doubt more than I believe. But every time I peer into the principles of God, the Word of God, an outside force moves into my life through the Spirit of God. And greater is He who is in me than is in me and who is in the world. And He begins to compel me in the direction that He wants to go. I know some of you are here and you're listening and you're like, wow, this God really is spiritual. I mean, He's talking about the Spirit of God coming into your life, being filled with the Holy Spirit and asking God to fill you with the Holy Spirit. Well, you know what? It's, it better be real because life has gotten real out there. So 
if, if I've learned anything over the last couple weeks is that I better have a faith that is a greater outside force than the reality of what's going on in the world around us. So the world's gotten real for all of us. All of us have been moved from our place of observation and we're all in it. It's real out there. So it better be, it's time for it to be real in here. COVID-19 is not idle. Fear is not idle. Confusion in the United States and the world is not idle. And it's time for our faith not to be idle either. It's time for a greater force within than all the forces that are trying to move us from without. It's time for a quickening. It's time for new wine. It's time for, as the wine represents the Spirit of God, it's time for God to fill us not with the anxiety, the old wine, the old expectations of the world, but to begin to break out and to pour some new expectations into us, the expectations of God for each and every one of us who loves us, who loves us so much. And he says, take all your anxieties and all your burdens and cast them upon me because I care for you. Little children, I know what you have need of before you even ask. Do not be anxious as those who don't know this, those who are on the outside and, and haven't experienced the love and the mercy of God. But know that I love you. Let that expectation of God's word and his spirit, the, most, the greatest story, don't let it remain idle in you any longer. Heavenly Father, as we come here and we come into your presence, as we join hands with maybe a family member or a friend in the room with us, or maybe if, like Peter, in this moment, we are traveling by ourselves to peer in and to take a look for ourselves. God, change our expectations. God, quicken us through the power of your Holy Spirit. Take us out of the rest of anxiety. Take us out of our motionless uh, morality, Lord God. Take us beyond the confusion. Take us, move on us other than the fear of the world. God, cause a power, an outside source greater than ourselves to move upon our spirits, upon our inertia, and move us in the direction of your kingdom. Father, we thank you. Lord God, do a new work in us. Pour your spirit into us so that the same spirit that rose the lifeless body of Jesus from the dead, let that same spirit quicken my marriage, quicken my mind, quicken my situation and my circumstances. We thank you, God. Trust you, I don't 
thank you for your love we thank you for your mercy we thank you for the confidence that you have given us that you will be with us we are those who get up and go and look into the tomb and we declare he is risen and our expectations in life are changed we not only benefit from that but let us be like the woman of the story we share a new expectation to the world around us. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to thank you, Crosstown, for your continued giving. I, it's been absolutely awesome, and I want to thank you. Um, I want to let you know that even though that we've made, we've gotten rid of some resources here at the church and even have made salary adjustments, uh, that we have not diminished your giving to any of the missions that we are committed to around the world and in this community, one cent. So we appreciate your faithfulness, particularly in these hard times, that you're continuing to honor God. We wanna salute you. Thanks again, and have a great day.